Securities offered through Satera Advisor Networks, LLC, member FINRA SIPC. Investment advisory services offered through CWM, LLC, an SEC-registered investment advisor. Satera Advisor Networks, LLC, is under separate ownership from any other named entity. Carson Partners, a division of CWM, LLC, is a nationwide partnership of advisors. This is The Way to Wealth. With host Scott Ford, a jujitsu fighting, woodworking, beekeeping entrepreneur who is also the managing director, partner, and wealth advisor of Carson Wealth. Financial freedom is the goal, and clarity and simplicity is how we'll get there. Let's get to it. This is Way to Wealth. Hello, and welcome back to the Way to Wealth podcast, where we're all about making money simple, allowing you to focus on living fully and living fully today not 30 years from now, because remember, today is really all we have. So let's do it. So really excited this week to have James Hughes. Jay Hughes uh, has quite an extensive bio, which I'm going to read a little bit to you in in multiple books. And that's exactly how I found Jay, as I read several books, uh, Family Wealth and Complete Family Wealth being one of them, and just really powerful advice as far as Ah, kind of what this whole thing's about. And also then how do you leave things besides money to the to the next generation? So uh, Mr. Hughes, a resident of Aspen, is the author of Family Wealth. That's the book I mentioned, the first one I read, Keeping It in the Family and of Family, The Compact Among Generations, both published by Bloomberg Press, co-author uh, at, with Keith Whitaker and Susan Masenzio, The Cycle of the Gift, And yeah, just everything that he's written and that I have followed as well as listening to Jay on several podcasts deeply resonated with me and was really excited to be able to have him on and share with the audience. And his website is jameshughes.com if you're interested in learning more. So with that, welcome to The Way to Wealth and thanks for joining on our podcast today, Jay. That is a delight. I'm looking forward to it. And um, I'm sure that we're going to have a wonderful conversation, having also had the pleasure of understanding something about you uh, earlier today. So thank you very much for inviting me. May I just make one quick adjustment? In order to get on my website, somebody has to put an E between James and Hughes. It's funny, the E doesn't sit out, but it's got to be there or it doesn't work. So www.james E. Hughes, H-U-G-H-E-S dot com. Okay, let's go. Thank you for that, because I relooked, and of course, that's what it says, and it flowed as James Hughes. Beautiful. (laughs) So with that, I know my audience has heard me talk about the infinite entrepreneur and the way to wealth, and really the purpose behind it all for me is living a life of health, wealth, wisdom, and happiness, and really what it's all about. And I have said many times for me, money's a tool. And so when I give the definitions behind each one of those, it's really having a sense of well-being in all areas of life. And I learned this years ago from Michael Singer and some of his works. In listening to you on a previous podcast, I didn't catch this in your books, and maybe it was there, but you actually defined what wealth, the definition of it. I'm like, oh my gosh, I got to I got to use that and then I got to be able to meet and speak with this guy. So I would love to hear you share the definition or what wealth is. Scott, um, I find this word, frankly, for many, many years, um, a very difficult word to deal with. And I tried actually to find other words that would bring into a human consciousness what the word I thought people were trying to define meant. Lo and behold, I went in the dictionary about a year and a half ago and discovered that the word wealth derives from an Anglo-Saxon word, two words, we, W-E-O-L, we all, we all. We have that word today in commonwealth and commonweal, two very easy places to find it. It means well-being, pure and simple, nothing else. Uh, Now, in modern times, we've taken the word wealth and made it essentially consciously financial capital. It isn't. Wealth means well-being. We owe wealth being. Um, 
I can say to our listeners today and our viewers that if they can consciously reprogram their brains so that when they hear the word wealth or they use the word wealth from the back of their brains, the picture comes of well-being. And they carry that to their left front cortex. They will achieve a level of thriving that will astonish them because it is actually using words to mean what they mean. Now, the equally important part of that work is also to consciously be able to bring from, again, the back of your brain, the picture part, to your left front cortex and your mouth. When you mean to speak of money, use the term financial capital. When you do that, you have not only consciously got the word wealth in its right place, well-being, but you're actually speaking to yourself and to whoever you're, is listening about what you're actually talking about. Money is financial capital. Now, you're going to ask me, so I'm just going to jump ahead and, and help everybody understand <laughs> what's he talking about. Scott, many, many years ago, I realized that one of the major issues for families trying to deal with wealth as well-being was that they couldn't then, particularly when they used wealth as money, they didn't have in their consciousnesses and their spirits what the actual capitals of their families were. The capital of any family is its spiritual capital. Does it have a purpose, a common purpose? I call it to enhance the individual journey of happiness of each family member, or in simple terms, are all the family members both rising? This is the spiritual capital of a family, which defines its priorities. If your priority is that each human being in your family, you seek to enhance his or her journey of happiness, Great. That's capital, spiritual capital. Uh, you don't have it, you won't get it. You do have it. You have it as a priority, growing that one. You have it. You grow it. Uh, social capital. Can you make decisions together? Oh, that sounds easy. Boy, it's not. Making good joint decisions is really hard. It means requiring giving up some freedom, doesn't it, to make a joint decision? Mm. By the way, hidden in that is that every family starts with two people. There's no one name family, by the way. Genesis doesn't, doesn't permit it, nor does the Genesis story in any culture permit it. Always two names. Mm -hmm. No blood, by the way. DNA, but no blood. That's another fallacy. So joint decision-making means two names making joint decisions. Hmm. Social capital. Intellectual capital. Are you a learning system? And not only are you individually learning, are you sharing what you learn? Oh, my goodness. Fourth economy is all about that, but it always was that way for families. And human capital. Are the human beings thriving and flourishing? And then you have financial capital. So you have four qualitative capitals. Hmm, qualitative. That's an interesting word and one quantitative capital. Many, many years ago, Scott, I was given a gift by my spirit guides of how to give a demonstration, a physical manifestation of what I'm talking about. And it's simply, it's a simple hand gesture. See, you know, my thumb goes up. My thumb is financial capital. By the way, if it wiggles, the other ones, you notice they disappear? Hmm. And all families that see themselves as their financial capital fail. Hmm. They don't have seven generations. They have three and they're out, mm -hmm. just like the short sleeve proverb says. But families that figure it out, look what happens when you turn over your hand. Spiritual capital, social capital, intellectual capital, human capital, financial capital. Look, financial capital has a purpose. Grow these. Huh? 
Yeah, financial capital now is a purpose. This is purposeless. Simple accumulation is purposeless, meaningless. This has purpose. And look what happens with the pinky. Spiritual capital is on top. Hmm. What's our purpose? What's our vision? And we make good decisions. Are we a learning system? Are we thriving human beings? And look, financial capital's got a job to support these. Hmm. That you, have, you might achieve seven generations. You might do what you're imagining, but you have to choose your priorities. One, not yours, Scott, but they are your priorities. But I should be careful with my English. One has one has hmm. to choose one's priorities. That's such a beautiful illustration. And yes, words matter. And the English language can be mm, messy. I think it's part of, uh, well, it's, it's without going too far down this rabbit hole, it's part of what happened, in my opinion, with colonization is use the English language because you basically have an out and you can twist at every corner where other languages weren't quite as easy to do that with. So when you shared that, Jay, I'll make this brief because my audience knows it, but I live a life and share a life of health, wealth, wisdom, and happiness. That's, and then I literally uh, was shared a message uh, with messengers as well. And it was this. So under each one of those uh, for health, it's spiritual, mental, physical, and with wealth, it's financial independence and being financially free. It's what way to wealth is designed to do. And then it's having enough then you're really wealthy. And then yes. it's love because that's the ultimate wealth is having love and recognizing you are love. And then with wisdom, wisdom is living in the present moment, having lots of experiences that create wisdom and then being a lifelong learner. And then happiness is having healthy relationships, having a dream that you're contributing to, then being grateful each day. So the, the message I got at one point, I was meditating. I'm like, oh, people are, so I have these things listed out. People come to see me for, to get financial independence. So they're coming to way to wealth. And I drew this arrow that came to the wealth. And then I said, oh yeah, but once they get there seeing they have enough, then when their true wealth is actually having love in your life and being it, then I drew this line from health, wealth, wisdom, and happiness. And it went uh, spiritual, it went love, it went living in the present moment, and it went healthy relationships. So the whole thing was a spiritual endeavor of, of sense of well-being. And the finances was just a means of exchange of capital supported. So I love your illustration and I, I have already used wealth and the we all. So I love that and we'll be continue to share it and we'll use your hand gesture and give Please. you credit if you don't mind. Cause I, I love I, that analogy. Give, give the spirit guides credit. I'm mm. just a, a vehicle. Thank you. Shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves. I think the audience knows it, but would you elaborate on that? Cause you have so much experience here. I would love to hear it from your vernacular. When we think about a flourishing family, which has been the question of, this lifetime for me, we must begin by understanding that Mother Nature's rules of the law of entropy, the second law of summer, and I'm not asking people to take physics, but basically what Mother Nature says is if someone has a dream, entrepreneurs, innovators, whatever, has a dream, most of us, seven and a half a billion of us, dream every night. Almost none of us retain a dream past waking in the morning. A very, very few of us do for some reason. We, the dream is so powerful that we aspire to that dream. We retain it. Hmm, shouldn't happen. Dreams are ineffable. But we do. Some people do. And then that dream hangs around, aspiring. Hmm. And we begin to be inspired by our own dream. Fascinating. And then we start to perspire to bring that dream to life. So we have an effable experience, dream, we retain it. And in remarkable ways, with help of wonderful young men like you, the dream manifests into materialization. Energy, dream, matter. Mm -hmm. huh. Sound familiar? Yes. <laughs> About 14 billion years ago, something happened with a big bang. <laughs> it was a dream. Oh, matter. Mm. There's not much matter in this universe, by the way. 
not much compared to the whole universe. So it's pretty unusual. So the first generation in the shirt sleeve proverb is a dreamer. Most people think of them as financial magicians of some kind. No, mm. they're just people like you and me who dream and who hold dreams and turn them into matter. Well, now what happens in family to that matter? Ah, this is very important. Because family comes to life from the first generation too, doesn't it? Two people who decide together to create something called family. So when you get to the first, what I call rising generation, people call it the second generation. I don't like, I call it first rising generation. What happens to the dream, the materialization of it? Well, those people tend to change where they live, change what they believe, go to the university, go join the country club, do a lot of things. They keep changing things. Unfortunately, in almost every family on the planet, that process leads to plateau and gradual difficulty with that materiality. But it's the family, not the money. It's mm. this, not this. The proverb is actually about this. Mm. this. And then in the classic state of the proverb, just as entropy, just as everything else in this universe, it becomes matter. The third generation, the bonds of family fall apart. And the matter goes back to energy. Mm. Now, Mother Nature says, that's fine. That's the law of my universe. Wake up, pay attention. It's not very pleasant. In fact, it's often extremely unpleasant. By the way, Scott, most families die by cold, not heat. They don't blow up in fission. They die in inertia of mm. cold. And if you want a quick illustration for our listeners and viewers, uh, just ask them, take a look at your personal device. Don't turn it on, please, but take a look at it. And I'll ask you this question. Do you have every single bit of connective information about your first cousins? Wait a minute, first cousins? I thought we were talking about grandchildren. Oh, same people. Third generation? Huh. Believe it or not, Scott, every audience in the world have asked that question. Less than 40% can answer the question. So their family bonds are coming apart. First mm -hmm. cousins are the grandchildren, third generation. Then I ask a second question. I say, okay, for those of you whose hands are still up, if you telephoned right this minute, any one of your first cousins, would they say, hey, Scott, great to hear from you? Less mm -hmm. than 10%. Mm -hmm. So this proverb is about the bonds of family, not its fortune. So it's pretty easy. And it isn't. So it's a slippery slope. Now, Great families, by the way, that, that do look at seven generation thinking, as you mentioned, a huge attention to fusion. Oh, physics again. Well, I thought that this wasn't a physics talk. What's he doing with, to me this morning? Fusion, fission, and inertia? What the devil is he talking about? Well, fusion is the miracle of our universe, Scott. One plus one makes three. Huh. He's right. That's the sun. So great families that make the seventh generation, as you're thinking about it, practice fusion. They ask, are my relationships with each member in my family creating fusion? One plus one plus three. Because the accretive energy of the three more than balances the inertial problem of cold. Well, what's your priority? How do you think about it? And remember, it's growing these that leads to fusion. This has to grow too. But surprisingly, amazingly, if you're growing these consciously, guess what? You have clients who grow these. Mm -hmm. Yes. Where yes. is your priority? And Mother Nature simply says in the proverb, hey, here are the rules. I'm giving you the rules. There's no, there's no secret here. You just decide which ones you practice. Where are your priorities? Yeah, you, you also, I've heard you talk about um, in, in ha enhancing in individual journeys. And I know you just really mentioned, you know, 
what this is about in, in a very unique and interesting way of nature and the law of entropy and fusion. And when you think of, so Legato, you see the logo behind me. So Legato right. family, that's the piece of the infinite entrepreneur of creating family values. And the logo is intentional. You see the, you see the D and the O connected. And then you see the flame coming out. And the illustrative part of the illustrative purpose of that is we're connecting one generation to the next. And instead of just passing financial capital, which is partly represented by the flame, and this is a, a new last hundred year phenomenon, you know, indigenous people weren't passing these right. liquid assets because they didn't have liquid assets. Now, all of a sudden, what they're saying is we can give you this flame, but in order to give you this flame, i.e. financial capital, we need to show you how to make the flame and do that so that you're able to handle the flame. You can make your own. And I just think that ties in partly to what you're saying is yeah, growing the human and growing that financial, supporting these other four areas of capital. Um, mm, really powerful stuff. And the other thing that I had thought about is Infinite Entrepreneur. And we talked about a docu-series coming up there. And the idea here is I'm a huge proponent and supporter of entrepreneurs and business owners. It's who I am. And I think they're sure. job creators and producers. Yeah. So that's where I, I want you to be. bet. <laughs> now, that said, what's so interesting is, well, who are they? Well, they're families. So what better way to support business owners and entrepreneurs than to support the family unit because they are the business owners and entrepreneurs. So keeping that congruent and actually starting here, to me, there's no better place. So I love this conversation and I know my audience will too. Promise that I do. So what would you say? And you shared some of the family for, uh, flourishing, I think, Jay, just as far as what you talked about here with inertia and what to focus on. Anything else to add there? Um, and then I know you had mentioned, um, can you live in the plan? And you had mentioned no scripts there. I would love to, to learn more of what you're referring to. Well, all human communities that we know about um, and I say that because writing is 6,000 years old, and we, and we certainly know something anthropologically and archaeologically about those who lived before writing. But all traditions speak to the question of human flourishing. This is the purpose of community. Hmm. So given the time we have, I'm going to say something very simple, but I think very powerful for our modern times. If you practice the things we're discussing this morning, if a family does that, then that family will flourish. And the individuals in it will be flourishing because the family can't flourish. It's two or more people. That's the definition of family. If the individuals aren't flourishing. Now, if the individuals are flourishing and the family is flourishing, then it's got the really important thing, as Aristotle said in early years, you cannot have a flourishing society without the first building blocks of that society being a flourishing family. Mm. So if a family really wants to understand the context, not only internally, which has been the principal conversation we've had this morning, but externally, and frankly, if the external world it's living in is not flourishing, then it's got a very rough go. So if it thinks of itself in a different way, if it says, well, if we flourish, which we want to do, we see that as a human reason for being, then it is true that we become the building block of a flourishing society. Um, we need this very, very badly. Now, you asked me a second question about living in the plant. So let me again be short this morning. Over the last few years, um, not to be uh, unpleasant or uh, disrespectful, I have asked hundreds and hundreds of practicing professionals whether their clients can live in the plan. They first look at me as if I'm from Mars. Mm. 
Then they look at me and they're unhappy. And then they say, truthfully, no, my clients can't live in the plan. Mm. And I say, well, then at least we can have a conversation. And, and of course, what are, what, are, what are we talking about? Well, let me put this in two quick ways. First, you said earlier in our conversation that plans, or you suggested it, that plans basically solve for taxes and they solve for creditor issues. By the way, the first is irrelevant, of course, to the living, uh, other than they have more financial capital, but it's mostly irrelevant. That's a war that first-generation wealth creators fight with a, a worthy opponent, the government, but has nothing to do with who lives in the plan. The second is actually pernicious. Remember I said it deals with creditors, because it actually says, by the way, that in this trust or whatever it may be, uh, you can live here and not pay your bills. What? Yes, because I'm worried that I created this materiality that we talked about before. I'm worried about being stolen from me. I'm dead, of course, but I'm worried about it being stolen from me. So I'm going to set this up in such a way that your mistakes don't affect my legacy. Huh? Huh? Yeah. Okay. Well, so that doesn't affect me living in the plan either. What's the problem of living in the plan? There are no scripts for who lives in the plan. Hmm. Oh, my colleagues say, oh, dear, you're right. There are no scripts, are there? No. No. There's a famous play, a terrible play, but a famous title, Six Characters in Search of an Author. Huh. Yeah, the plans are six characters in search of an author. There are no scripts for who plays in the play. So guess what? The plays don't work. The structures actually help Mother Nature get rid of the family. They help it, help her. Hmm. Because the family can't live in the plan. Of course not. Families aren't born as beneficiaries or limited partners or philanthropists. Of course they're not. Those aren't their vocations, for heaven's sakes. Finding their work is, and learning to love and learning to work is the core of a life. Mm. Being a something, something, something in a play that you didn't sign up for and you have no script for, what, how, how likely are you to be successful living in that play? Probably not very successful. So living in the plan? No. Clients can't live in the plan. The tragedy is they can't survive the plan, much less thrive and flourish in it. Now, it isn't that inherently the plans are intentionally bad, just don't work. I'm, by the way, I was a practicing lawyer for half of my career, and I wrote the plans and the reason I stopped doing that in the second half of my career is that I realized everything I'm sharing with you today. It was, it was morally unsatisfactory. Mm. How could I be asked to help a family avoid the proverb? And unintentionally, I certainly wasn't intentionally, I was writing plans they couldn't live in. Paying me a lot of money for that, by the way. Mm. But it wasn't a good bargain. The, the bargain is, can the planner create a play as its author in which the characters have, know the author, know the script, and can play in the play? Mm. Now you're creating energy in that structure. One of our great people in our world wrote a paper called Culture Eats structure for breakfast. And he was absolutely right. Mm. I have so experienced exactly what you're sharing in that, um, in, in all the different professions. And obviously I'm in wealth management, financial services, and I've had experiences in the past of consulting with tax attorneys, estate planning attorneys, et cetera. And I've seen 
wonderful domestic asset protection trust, dynasty trust, all these different beautiful structures. And I've also seen it can be unlivable. Like you're getting into something that's going to avoid estate and going to protect assets. And the person may not be able to live it or it's complicated their life far more than they wanted or recognized. And so that just sounds not being able to live the script to me as you were um, just sharing. Three things have been my experience. I think this speaks to it. In this, I've been doing this since 91. And the three patterns that I've seen over and over in wealth management, which would include estate planning, asset protection, is there's far too much advice given without a complete thorough understanding. And all fields are guilty of this. What I mean by this is typically we'll hear maybe 30, if we're lucky, 40% of a conversation and immediately launch into solution mode because we got all these arrows in our quiver and we're going to immediately solve the problem. And the real juice is the last 5% of the conversation. That's where the advice is easy as far as what's the solution once you create the time, space, and margin in life to get to that last 5%. So for me, that's the not being able to live the script is we got to get to that first checkbox. Then the second So there's not nearly enough teamwork. There's far too many silos and egos, I like to say. Silos being individuals who have to be the smartest person in the room, and they have an ego, and they got to give you the best answer versus let's just get to the best answer. I don't care who comes up with it and working collaboratively as a team. And then third, not nearly enough education given financial education specifically so that we human beings can understand what's happening. You don't have to know all the details, just enough to go, yep, this is right for me. So there are the three things. I think it's part of why you can't live in the script. So it feels like it ties in. Well, Scott, it ties in perfectly. And I'm conscious of time. So I'm going to just add this for our watchers and listeners. If you want a plan that a beneficiary can live in, Start it with two sentences. This trust is a gift of love. This trust exists to enhance the lives of its beneficiaries. Pay no attention to the other 40 pages. But the first two sentences must be, this trust is a gift of love. This trust exists to exist the lives of its beneficiaries. Why? That's a script. The beneficiary and the trustee, this is just one of dozens of hints. But start there. You have a script. Mm. The people that actually are going to live in that human relationship between that trustee and beneficiary. Mm. I love that. That's the idea of, of our, in our case, Legato family, there's plenty of ways to, to do this. And you're giving an example. We call it our seven generation family constitution, which is sharing the purpose of the trust, the preamble to the trust, the why behind the trust, and then the trust can have its language. So I so resonate with that. What would you say, Jay, if you were to share with the audience, this is really resonating that, look, yes, at the end of the day, um, humans, which we are, are wanting to flourish. How to do it is, or if, if it's at least two people, you're a family. What would you say would be good next steps? You mentioned something that a colleague wrote as far as culture, trumping strategy. What would you recommend would be a way where they can structure something or at least take a step in the direction of a family flourishing? Well, when we talked about the proverb, I'm going to repeat this because it is not common consciousness. The proverb is not about the loss of financial capital. That is a consequence. The church sleeve to shirt sleeve proverb is about the life of a family. Does it avoid three generations and out and seek seven? What is its priority? What I would say is, that pausing to decide priority among many priorities is the first waiting, not yet step. 
What is our priority? Let me also say that for first-generation financial capital creators, family is often not number one priority. Mat continuing manifestation of that dream is number one priority. So the pause to ask about priority, Scott, is the most critical of all. And if priority then is not, remember, do as I say, not as I say, do as I do. What, what do I demonstrate as my priority? Oh, that's hugely important. Because the second and third or first and second rising generations will pay no attention to what is said. They will pay entire attention to what you do. What is your priority? If you, are you preaching at me or are you asking me to join something? Oh, my goodness, is that important. Mm. So the great question is, if one wants to have a family that avoids the proverb, flourishes and goes on for multiple generations, what I would say is that after the pause that determines priority and doing, not speaking, and boy, is this hard. Then starting by looking at what one's capitals consist of, how are we doing with our spiritual capital? How are we doing with our social capital? Can we make decisions or not together? How are we doing with our intellectual capital? Are we a learning system, really, or just so say so? Are our human beings thriving? Do we need to give them some boosts? Mm. Do they have scripts? Not just for what the financial capital structures are going to be, they have scripts for their lives. Are they learning to love? Are they learning to work? All of the core fundamental questions. Well, when you look at how your capitals actually are, you know where to put your time and your energy. If, you, if that, your priority is family, long distance running family, flourishing family, then you want to find out what your assets are. And then you want to grow those assets. Liabilities, the plan, believe it or not, as we said, often is one of the liabilities. Sure, ill health, bad decisions, the, the reciprocals of all the capitals. But don't miss what we discussed today. The plan may be a liability. Mm. Enough said. Well said. Um, so with that, Jay, thank you for sharing so much knowledge. A wonderful um, honor to have the opportunity to listen and learn and share you with our audience. And so maybe someday, time permitting, we can uh, do this again. I know you have a lot more you could share. So want to be cognizant of your time. And for people wanting to learn more, is your website the best place for them to uh, dig deeper? I would suggest, uh, yes, Tom. And I would also suggest um, that there, there is a foundation that was created uh, in my name about a year ago by some very dear friends. Um, worthiness, of course, is an enormous question when there's a philanthropy with your name on it that somebody else was generous to create. There is also quite a lot of uh, information, I think, and that uh, website is www.jehjf.org, www.jehjf.org. Uh, I would say both of these places would give someone an opportunity to consider some of what we're discussing this morning and also uh, think a little bit perhaps, well, hmm, I think I'd like to do that. I hope that would be the outcome. Yeah. And we'll keep, I'll put that in the show notes, uh, jehjf.org, and we'll list that in the show notes for listeners to Thank follow you. up. Thank you for sharing your wisdom, Jay. And hopefully our paths cross again in the near future or in the future. And audience, thanks for listening. Uh, we'll see you back next week on the Way to Wealth podcast where we're all about making money simple, allowing you to focus on living life fully and doing that today. So we'll see you all next week. 
The opinions voiced in Way to Wealth with Scott Ford, Managing Director, Partner, and Wealth Advisor of Carson Wealth, are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested into directly. Investing involves risk, including possible loss of principal. No strategy assures success or protects against loss. To determine what may be appropriate for you, consult with your attorney, accountant, financial or tax advisor prior to investing. Guests on Way to Wealth are not affiliated with CWM LLC or Satera Advisor Networks LLC. Legato Family is not affiliated with Satera Advisor Networks LLC or CWM LLC. Carson Wealth, 19833 Leitersburg Pike, Suite 1, Hagerstown, Maryland, 21742.